I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, the Arakwell people of the Bunjalung Nation, and pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to the Human Design Podcast with me, your host, Emma Dunwoody. I'm a qualified master coach and human behavior specialist, as well as being a qualified human design coach. And I work with clients every single day to answer the big questions. Who am I? Why am I here? And what is my purpose? I also assist them to transition from the person they think they should be to the person they really are on the inside. I teach people how to actually live their design instead of just knowing it. And if this is something that you want to do too, well, stay tuned or reach out for private coaching or human design unpacks where I show you exactly how to live your design. Hey, hey, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. Oh my goodness, I'm so excited. I finally get to bring you uh, a conversation with two incredible humans, Jeffrey Stegman and Clayton Stedman. Now, you mightn't know these names, but these are the guys, the creators of the FLFE that you have definitely heard me talk about. I think these two guys are the real deal, so genuine, and the work that they're creating in the world is so profound and important. In case you don't know what I'm talking about, Focused Life Force Energy began in 2008 when two men, Jeffrey and Clayton, with an interest in high consciousness fields, met through a mutual friend. After coming across the beginnings of an invention that would become part of the FLFE system, Jeffrey Stegman and Clayton Stedman worked together to develop it into more. Eventually, they would broadcast high consciousness fields to specific locations around the world. They poured thousands of hours into research and development to share this technology. Beginning with service projects and targeting trauma areas like refugee camps, FLFE grew into a private company and is now invited into the lives of thousands of people in over 80 countries. We still donate approximately 90% of our service with global projects, including support for bees, whales and dolphins, as well as other larger global projects. FLFE is a thriving international organization that continues to explore what is in the highest and best interest of all creation. This conversation with Jeffrey and Clayton was fantastic. And I feel like I just started. There was, I could have talked to these guys for hours upon hours upon hours. They're my go-to when um, it comes to really understanding consciousness and how it works. And in this episode, we really talk about thoughts and thought forms and how we do tend to be experiencing other people's thoughts. Now, through human design, this is no surprise to us. It feels, for me, it's, you know, human design really backs up a lot of what these guys have discovered through their research. So anyway, I could bang on about these awesome humans and their incredible product, the FLFE, for hours. But instead, I'm going to let you go and listen for yourself. Enjoy. Hey, hey, everyone, and welcome to today's episode. I am so excited to have this conversation with two humans that I've got to know just a little bit, and I have experienced their work um, for quite a while in the FLFE. I think I first put it on the house in 2019 or the late 2018 even. So welcome to the podcast, Clayton Stedman and Jeffrey Stegman. Welcome. Yeah, great to be here. Thank you, Emma. Good to see you. Oh, I'm so excited. Do you know, every time um, we chat, I know you did a, you taught a class in my online retreat, which was so incredible. And still to this day, we're all referring back to it in my, my community. So it's so exciting. But I'm always concerned that I'm going to get Stedman and Stegman mixed up. It's like, what are the odds? <laughs> like, how does that work? But um, yeah, I love that. So... Your um, your passion, I would say, is um, consciousness and really helping us raise our consciousness. Now, I'd love to sort of start at the beginning because I think in the spiritual world, 
we're always talking about, you know, raising our vibration and we're talking about raising our consciousness. Um, and we kind of talk about these more heighty topics and subjects, but perhaps a great place to start might actually be understanding, you know, what is consciousness and why does it matter that we're actually raising it, especially at this time on planet Earth? Mm. Start with the easy questions. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that, yeah, I know. <laughs> Big, fat, wide, open questions. No, it's it's great. I mean, I'll start, Clayton, and pass it off to you. Um, yeah, from my perspective, consciousness is the basis of reality, of everything. And um, we're swimming in that field of consciousness and many different fields of consciousness uh, they're all all around us all the time that it's not just in a brain, but it's really everywhere. And that, you know, in that, um, there's a scale of vibration, a scale of of consciousness. Uh, and there's, you know, many different people who have created scales or ways to measure that. Um, there's there's a scientist in at Harvard who did so, and Dr. David Hawkins is another that we follow and we use his map of consciousness. But but we all feel that in everyday life. And, you know, there were those lower vibrations on the scale or lower consciousness on the scale would be like anger, you know, depression or resignation to something that's not good that you have to live with. Um, and you know, as we move up into, and Clayton can go in more into the scale, but into the higher levels, like into love and the more transcendent levels above love, it's just a different experience of life. You know, we we equate it to more freedom, like, like the, the higher up the scale you go, the more freedom you have and the more joy and love you have in your life. Mm, I love that. And it's yeah. so... You know, one of the things that I thought was fascinating, and I really am super excited for Clayton to talk about the the Hawkins scale because I think this is such a me being a very practical person. It's something that really helped me bring it down to earth. This thing that we can't see, but we know it's there. It kind of grounded it for me. But I love like one of the things that was a real game changer for me back when I first started reading Power versus Force. And I was blown away by this book. I was texting my kinesiologist at every chapter going, oh, my God, is this real? Is this true? Then why, are we, why don't we live like this all the time? Like it was just blowing my mind. But that understanding of it was the moment that I really started to understand that, no, we don't have to struggle. It's like it really is a choice if we're mm -hmm. we're struggling and choosing those those lower frequencies. I also loved like, it was also a moment for me with anger, un understanding that anger was this emotion that we do poo-poo a lot. However, I remember reading in, I think it was pa Power Versus Force, is it's like it's our first emotion that creates momentum. It means that, you know, anger usually creates action. And I was like, okay, so that's not necessarily a bad thing as long as it's moving towards uh, this this new direction. But, um, yeah, I'm overexcited and getting ahead of myself. So Clayton, tell us about the, you know, respond to that question. Also telling us about that Hawkins scale. What is it and what does it mean to us? So yeah, the um, consciousness, we did a, a podcast on it, Fields of Consciousness, where we talked about it for about an hour. And what I remember, and, and I don't think we've covered one tenth of what could be covered about what is consciousness. There's lots to talk about. And Consciousness for us humans is like asking a fish about water. Unless a fish is jumping out of the water, they don't even know they're in it. And so I agree with Jeff that consciousness is the, the primordial substrate that we live in. And uh, just like that fish, it's hard to remember that we're constantly in it. We're, in a, we're actually in a very thin, a very, very thin soup of of energy all the time that's you know people call it prana or chi and then that thin soup are wonderful things like bacteria and viruses that help our body evolve and so we don't have to be afraid of them as long as our immune system is strong and we're healthy 
then um, that is uh, part of how humanity has become so resilient is that we've adapted to the ever-changing environment around us. Now, you know, in this day and age, when you say viruses, there's a whole bunch of stories that people start to go, you know, places they go to in their mind. I'm not saying that there wasn't a, a very uh, strong virus. And, and I think there's too much fear about our environment and what's going to get us versus us going within ourselves and increasing our resiliency in the way that we can as people and focus on that versus trying to, you know, well, versus unconsciously focusing on being afraid and feeling like a victim to the world and to the environment, you know, environment's not out to get us it just is mm -hmm. what it is. So that would be a few thoughts on consciousness and uh, why is it important? Yeah. I like what you, what, what, what you said, Jeff, it's really about your quality of life. So the higher your level of consciousness, the higher your quality of life. And in uh, one of Dr. Hawkins' books, he has a correlation between levels of consciousness and quality of life. And he has unemployment rate, divorce rate, you know, health and sickness. There's all these different qualities, maybe 10 different ones. I don't know them off the top of my, off, uh, top of my head. But there's many different ways to measure the increased quality of life that comes with an increased level of consciousness. Just about every metric you can mm -hmm. imagine gets better the higher your consciousness goes. Yeah, I love that. And I think that, you know, we talk a lot um, in, at least in this world, in the, the more spiritual world, even the sciences these days, things like biohacking, quantum physics, we're talking so much about how, you know, to raise our consciousness to, you know, we're actually heading for this new world. We, to, we talk about the new paradigm um, and it's this, this elevation. And I think sometimes we almost try too hard and we, we're missing the point because I think Zach Bush, I, I listen to a lot of his stuff and you know, he's always talking about love and beauty and joy, um, similarly to you guys. And it's, it's this piece that we need to understand that, yes, we are living in this time of chaos um, but it's not irresponsible to have joy and fun and play and these lighter energies because this is actually part of the our raising of our own consciousness, which, you know, um, I think sometimes we it's almost like we don't believe that that it could be that easy, if you like, but <laughs> it really is. It's almost our, our work to do in the world, right? Yeah, that easy and that hard. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's so funny. I'm just, I'm days away from leaving Australia to go to Spain um, to walk the Camino. And my entire, like my overarching um, intention is exactly that to, to mm. continue to have the growth that I've always had and to let go of the challenge. You know, like mm -hmm. I was saying mm. to a friend of mine just this morning, I'm like, I know, put me in any challenging situation. I've got you. But tell me to just have fun and enjoy the ride. <laughs> that's hard. Like, that's much harder. <laughs> Don't do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, but the Camino has some pretty interesting consciousness fields. Mm. I mean, centuries of pilgrims, you know, transversing the Camino to for their own growth and consciousness. I don't know if you can get any calibrations, Clayton, but uh yeah, yeah. Take a few pictures of the places that you feel are really good and then send me send me a picture and I'll test the LOC of that place for you. And maybe some buildings or places like that. Oh my God, I love that. I will yep, done. I done. It's it's because I did it back in 2018 and um my life completely changed after it. But mm. walking the Camino, I just remember saying so many times, my God, if the rest of the world was like this, we'd have no problems. You know, like it's safe and people are open hearted and, you know, people, it's even like people respect each other's boundaries. Like, do you want to walk with people today or do you want to walk on your own? Like no one's offended. It's it's a very different world. So super exciting. I have another now, question for you. I, I, yeah. Here's another thought about the Camino. Um, see if you can discern if there's any angelic presences that walk with the people doing the pilgrimage. Mm. Oh, I, I love don't that. think it's I don't think it's only the land and the lovingness and the intentionality that goes into the the pilgrimage I I'm curious if there are uh, beings you know angelic beings or higher consciousness beings in a different dimension people have passed over or whatever 
that accompany people on their pilgrimage and help them out of respect for their devotion and the effort they've made to get there. Oh my God. I love that. And I've got head to toe goosebumps. Yeah. So it's like my entire team is like, yeah. And there's yeah. this thing, one of the sayings on the Camino is um, the Camino provides. So mm. you find there's just these little miracles that happen all the time. You know, when you just can't go, I remember my first day and we walked um, an example of exactly what I was saying earlier. The first um, day is the hardest terrain wise. Mm. And the day that we did it last time, it was a day that they call a death day because the weather was so bad. You know, they don't actually advise you to go up and over. They advise you to go around. Um, but we, of course, went up and over. And I remember having this moment that I was like, oh, my God, like if I have to, I can't do this. I can't keep going. And as we came around this corner, there was this little van with a little shelter and hot chocolate. And I was just like, this is it this is miraculous. Like, how can I be at this place where I feel like I really can't go any further and this appears? And I've honestly wondered, I've honestly reflected and thought, I wonder if that van turns up exactly at that point for everyone else. And that there's all these different little timelines and stuff like like it's not actually just there. It's just there for me because that was my moment, you know? Like I've often wondered because that's how magical the Camino feels. It's it's very cool. Yeah, I've never um, had that thought before so, about the angelic beings on the Camino. And Jeff and I often, you know, we we're writing an email today and it's like, we had that thought. And it's like, no, hold on a second. We received that thought. Yeah. So it might not be our thought. I love that. Can we talk about that? Because I, on when we did the class on our retreat, that was something that just was so, there was a part of me that a massive amount of relief lifted off because it was almost like that external confirmation. Because as I mentioned um, in the class that I'd experienced, I've experienced a lot of depression and panic disorder in my twenties and early thirties. And there were times that I was, I was on my knees, like, this is not me. Like, what is this? Like the thoughts that I'm having, this is not me. So I'd really love to, I love you guys to respond to that. And in, you know, in your research, in the work that you've been doing, what do you understand about how we experience thoughts? Like, are they ours? Are they others? What, what are they? Well, there's thought forms and, and, you know, when we do our, our research, so we have our lab with Dr. David or Dr. Gary Schwartz and our research team. But then we have the kinesiology research that we do. And that's really been applied to thoughts. Though in a high consciousness field, one of the researches we did with Gary was a customer experience survey. And it was so much easier to turn a, po a negative thought into a positive thought. So that sort of transition of moving from that negative field or negative way of being to a positive one was much easier. Um, but thought forms are all around us. Um, we had the story from a customer. I don't know if we talked about it during during the course. They, they were hiking in the woods, someplace they'd never been. They came out of the woods onto the highway and um, they were behind a big billboard. And they just started talking about French fries. Like, let's get French fries. Where can we get French fries? I really want French fries. And they walked around the billboard to go look for French fries. And there on the billboard was a giant French fry, you know, container. So mm. there were thought forms of French fries around that billboard that were affecting them. And they were completely, you know, unconscious about it. It's like they were ready to go eat French fries. And it was either thought forms from people driving by who suddenly that, or maybe there were intentional thought forms around that billboard uh, that were placed there. Um, so it's, it's hard to know, but all there's thoughts coming in all the time. And mm. a percentage are, is our brain producing a thought, but a large percentage is not us. And it's affected by level of consciousness. So in a lower state, you attract negative thoughts that aren't your thoughts. And as you go higher up the scale, um, you know, into the love zone and nonlinear, then you're attracting more positive, like wisdom, like 
Leighton had this thought about the El, you know, on the El Camino, there's some something, a high consciousness being that walks with people. Uh, it wasn't his thought, but but those kind of help that we uh, ask, you know, asking for help and asking for answers to questions, those thoughts are not our thoughts either. And we might feel really smart if we think they're our thoughts, but they're really coming from from a higher source. Yeah, you know, I think that thought about the El Camino was a gift to you to help you with your trip, to help your serve your community, to help you evolve because of your commitment and devotion. Mm -hmm. Now, I have no idea of proving that. I can test with kinesiology the level of consciousness of that being that sent that thought, and I can calibrate the level of interpretation that I have. So, you know, you're looking for maybe 95% clarity because there's always a, a loss of clarity from one dimension to another. So that's my, that's my operating theory. And I just call it that because if we try to get into proving where your thoughts come from, it gets to be pretty difficult to do, but I think it is worth talking about. I, I'll tell you a little story as well, Emma. I was walking down the street here in Nelson on Baker street, the main street. And there was a person who, um, was panhandling and I had a really negative thought about them. I was like, I was, it was so negative that I would be embarrassed if there was like a thought cloud, you know, that we carried around yep. people seeing it. I'd be like, Oh no, I'm like, <laughs> you know, I'm in trouble. Uh, if there was a thought bank it would have been a big withdrawal out of the thought bank. And I walked by and then the thought went away and I was just in the process of canceling it and checking in with myself to see what's going on. And I, I sort of went around the corner and I stood there for a while. And I figured out that it wasn't my thought. It was the thought field around that person. They were so low. And I think they've had maybe so many people project a negative thought onto them, or they have projected negative thoughts out or a combination of the above, maybe more. But it, around that person, you will, I think other people would have those thoughts. And I would just happen to pick it up. Maybe I'm a little more sensitive to most, or I was in that moment, I was more sensitive. So it's a really interesting conversation. I think this is a, this is a big conversation and we have like, we love pie charts and graphs and percentages. So we did do a pie chart one time talking about different levels of consciousness and the sources of all their thoughts and where wow. they come from. And, and we got it to, we got it to a certain level of truth that wasn't really exciting and it was pretty good, but we're used to being able to figure those things out and get them really kind of pristine. And we just hadn't put the time in. So if we get our pie charts nice and fancy and we feel really excited about it, maybe we'll share it with you one time. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'm nerding out about it. I love that. Yeah. I think, you know, with human design, we have this way that we can start to understand that. You know, we talk about it. It's in our undefined centers. And I tell a, a story or one of my experiences where I have a specific sensor, which is um, it's the spleen and it's undefined, which means that I'm taking in other people's energy, amplifying mm. it and re reflecting mm. it back. And in the spleen sits fear. And my example that I um, often use is that I remember a few, it's probably a number of months ago now, I was sitting on a plane, um, minding my own business, reading my book. And all of a sudden I have this vision of the plane blowing up on the runway now years ago when I was in anxiety I'd be like oh my god am I seeing something I'd be freaking out I'd be whatever but it's in that moment that I'm fully aware I just turned to the, the person next to me gently and didn't say anything out loud and I was just like it's all gonna be okay you know like I knew it was his and it wasn't mine um and I think because in my work what I realize is so often where the thinking other people's thoughts or feeling other people's feelings or fears or emotions. Um, and then we identify with them. And that's where the problem um, arises because it becomes part of our subconscious mind, our identity. We try to fix things that aren't even there to be fixed. We've just created this neural pathway that almost isn't ours. So I love this idea that raising our awareness around that might not even be my thought. There might be nothing here for me to do other than mm -hmm. feel compassion for someone nearby and I think that in itself is so powerful. Yeah, forgive yourself for experiencing the thought, have compassion for yourself, have compassion for the other person, send them a blessing, ask the divine to release the suffering that they're probably experiencing from them so they can find more freedom. Yeah. Uh, that's, yeah, that's... I love that. 
Can we talk a little bit about what exactly the consciousness scale is? So when we talk about the Hawkins scale, um, because then I want to ask you, I know we quickly touched on this before I hit record, but then I want to ask you, because there's lots of people out there talking about, oh, you know, you can get your consciousness up to 2000. And my gut says, no, you can't. So I'd really love to, and I'm not an expert. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, let's talk about what the consciousness scale is and how we, you know, we hear you talk about calibration. What are we actually calibrating? Um, and then let's talk about this 2000 stuff. You want to start it off, Jeff? I've been talking a little bit more than you, so I'll, I'll pick up. Well, the Hawkins map, sure. Dr. David Hawkins, power versus force. Um, you can find the map there and and uh, many other places. And it is a, um, it's a scale, it's a logarithmic scale. Each point upwards is 10 times more energy present. And the, the uh, scale or map, you tend to call it the consciousness map. Um, you know, it's not, it, it's not zero. It doesn't start at zero. It starts above zero. You could say one because everything has consciousness of some sort and it's goes to in, infinity or you could say divinity unlimited power and you know the 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 peak of power um and so in the human realm it's been in this to a thousand you know like one to a thousand and they can give you more you know details about how many people have made that thousand level and how many people today are over 600 and it's really just a handful so it's a very small number. And the reason that we've seen with our research is the human nervous system. So some people are born with a nervous system that can take them further. So, so it really seems to come down to like the wiring in your house. If you, if you have a uh, outlet, you know, or circuit to the 20 amp circuit, you need wires of a certain size. And if you have a 50 amp circuit, you need bigger wires uh, to carry that, that energy. And it's really the same, we believe, with rising up to scale in consciousness that the nervous system, which is not just the neurons, it's the myelin sheath as well, which in our understanding is the, is the analog nervous system. And you have the digital nervous system that's your, 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 your synapses. So that particularly that analog nervous system needs to carry all this energy that's flowing through us. You know, it's been called chi, prana, life force energy. But that the higher you go up the consciousness scale, the, the, the more of that energy, that subtle energy is flowing through us and through, and through our nerves. And there is an electrical component to that, which Dr. Hawkins has talked about, um, that you could measure. So you know, the scale starts below, below 200 is, you know, the negative side. Um, maybe I'll pass it over to you, Clayton, to pick up the exact scale. Sure. So it starts down at like shame is 20, despair is 50, 100 is fear, 150 is anger. And there is more energy in anger than there is in despair and fear. And so anger can be relatively positive, as you mentioned earlier, Emma, uh, it's, you know, it's higher than being a tired, helpless victim. Um, 190, 180, 190, that's in the range of pride. There's false pride, and then there's, you know, positive pride. And at 200 is courage, that's integrity. Uh, 250 is neutral, 300 is willingness, 400 is reason. That's where you have in the high 400s, you're legal professions and you know accounting professions where they have generally accepted principles that are practiced in a standardized way so that people can communicate around the world according to those principles um, you know when you have a training program like you know i'm just thinking of the military because i was watching a documentary on helicopter pilots and search and rescue the other day for some reason and their training is exactly the same everywhere in the country it was about the United States and I live in Canada, but so they have the same language everywhere so that when, you know, if someone leaves their job and goes to another area, they, you know, they can communicate with each other. 
So the perf the four hundreds are the the professions. Five hundred is love, as Jeff said. Six hundred is the beginning of enlightenment. Seven hundred is enlightenment, and it goes up to a thousand. And the the basic premise of kinesiology is that we are connected to divinity, to God, to the one creator of all that is, the universal intelligence, all the time. And of course, we're part of it. That's the basic premise. So uh, four hundred is reason on the Hawkins map of consciousness, and it is the level of the professions, the legal profession, the accounting profession, anywhere where there's standardized rules, uh, typically a governance body that will uh, help regulate the profession, and hold people accountable and, and uh, support them to maintain their status. A lot of accountants and lawyers, they have to do personal professional development every year to maintain their, their credentials. So that's a quality of the professions. And, uh, you know, 500 is is love. 550 is unconditional, uh, unconditional love. 600 is the beginning of enlightenment or peace. And 700 is where enlightenment begins to ripen. Or was, say, more fully ripened. And it's ripening all the way up to 1,000. Um, so the, the basis of kinesiology is, the, is that we're always connected to the divine because we're part of the divine. So we're always connected to God, universal intelligence, the one creator of all it is, whatever you want to call it. And that through kinesiology and forming positive declarative statements. So positive declarative statements are necessary because the world is a positive place. If it wasn't a positive place, it wouldn't exist. So when people are wondering, you know, if the world's, well, everything that exists has to be positive. So that's why when Jeff mentioned the scale actually starts at one to infinity, it doesn't start at zero because zero doesn't exist. Mm. So that's a bit, you know, maybe obvious, but um, so the, 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 the opportunity that kinesiology provides is for us to find out how to talk to the universe in the language that it uses, which is positive declarative statements and to find ways to uh, ask the questions in the right context. Mm. So asking the perfect question is probably, or asking an excellent question is, is often the biggest challenge with kinesiology. So one of the tricks of kinesiology is that uh, only about 25% of the pe people on the planet can do it. Now, if you're below 200, very difficult to do kinesiology or impossible. Um, sometimes you can go up above 200 for a while and, and, and you'll, test, uh, you'll test truly, we'll say. And, um, and even people that are very high, for some reason, their nervous systems don't allow them to do kinesiology. We assume it's a karmic issue, but we're not sure. I'm so fact, fascinated by that because I have, I wonder if I'm one of those people who can't do it. Like I'm connected and, and information yes. comes through me. Like, absolutely. But when I consciously try to like a muscle test and like, sometimes mm -hmm. it works and sometimes it doesn't. And I've never been able to work out whether it's just my mind getting involved. Um, Cause I do tend to try way too hard at everything. Um, mm -hmm. But that's really interesting. That's really fascinating. I mean, you're a pretty high level of conscious person. You're definitely over 500. And I, I don't think that you can test accurately most of the time. Mm. So we have to sort of run through a bunch of variables around that. There's things you can do temporarily, like a thymus thump. And um, is there, sometimes it's an autoimmune, a temporary autoimmune response. But just to, just to say that, you know, some people just can't do kinesiology well. And they're, you know, they're spiritual devotees, as devoted as any of us on the call. And they're not, they're not doing anything wrong. There's just some reason that they can't test. And maybe nobody, maybe nobody knows how to figure out all the reasons why that's true. So this brings us up to um, the challenge of listening to people's testing. Mm. So I've just, I've done about 9.6 million calibrations. Wow. I've made more mistakes in kinesiology than anybody that I know because I do so much of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a, and that's I've a been, good statistic. <laughs> yeah. And I've been humbled so many times. It's, you know, and um, there was a time when I was doing kinesiology, I was into kinesiology about 
I've done about 700,000 uh, uh, calibrations. And I, I had a certain amount of accuracy and there was certain, and there was some conditions where my testing would be consistent, but it seemed high. Like, so if I'm correct, over the previous week, there's only six people that live over 600 on the Hawkins map 98% of the time. Wow. Can you so tell me who pretty... those people are? <laughs> some of them. <laughs> uh, and that's a really hard grade. I don't know if they should be graded that hard. And I'm kind of looking at, we have a gentleman we work with, Dr. Gary Schwartz, and I want to talk to Gary about grading, Jeff. Mm -hmm. So if you look at, you know, what percentage of people on the planet or, or what number of people are on the planet um, are over 680% of the time over the previous week, then you get into the hundreds, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's a, you know, so you really have to, and that's where, you know, having that good question, Right is because people will come out of a workshop and they'll be in a very high state. They could be seven or 800 and they test themselves. It's like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm 800. I'm one of the enlightened people on the planet. Well, probably not. You know, you have to test it over a period of, of a week. If you don't test it over an average over a, a period of time, then it defaults to the instant that you do the calibration. Mm. So one of the things you can do. So when you're testing people, for example, so we're going to talk about controls, right? If you assume Dr. Hawkins' kinesiology is accurate, then you can go into his books and you'll find spiritual teachers. Now, Dr. Hawkins, he was so good at kinesiology, I believe he was unconsciously competent. Yeah. <clears throat> and so if you look at the protocols in Power Versus Force, you'll notice that there's things, if you read the books enough times, that he says to do in kinesiology that he's not doing in the book, he's not saying in the books. So if you go to page 117, paragraph two, in the first edition of Power Versus Force, he says, he says to the effect that you might find it very interesting to measure the level of consciousness of your inquiries. Mm. But he doesn't say that at the back of the book. Now, the paradox is, if you are not good at kinesiology, how do you measure the level of consciousness of your inquiries? So getting good at kinesiology is a very iterative, iterative process. You make little gains, little gains, little gains. You can take training on it. The, the world of nutrition, if you have really good inquiries about testing things and the person is a good tester and the field of testing uh, supplements, particularly in food with kinesiology, has strong principles and a thought field around it. Like we talked about a thought field. Mm -hmm. So you can step into that and get expertise that you might not get in other places because of the, the profession that's evolved in that. And that's mm -hmm. one way to test. So if someone's telling you that someone's at 2000 on the Hawkins map, if you ask them to calibrate the level of consciousness of the book, power versus force, the level of consciousness that book is in the back. And then you can ask them to test a chapter because the chapters are in the back of the book. Now the chapters of a book don't change. Whereas a person's level of consciousness, for example, Jesus, he was a thousand when he was alive, but since he's passed over, he's continued to grow. So he won't test at a thousand. He'll test the last time I checked was 1252. Assuming I'm correct. I'm prob probably close. Mm -hmm. So, if you're looking to Love um, that. test people's ability to gather accurate data with kinesiology, they, you know, you can ask them to test a chapter in the back of power versus force and the, the chapters are listed there in their level of consciousness. You could, you know, you can ask for they've done their training if they've done, if it had, if it had success with nutrition, which is kind of an established industry. Uh, you can hold up a paper bag and you can have a packet of, something that is not a good food, like the standard um, test that Hawkins did was, uh, I think he, well, I won't tell you what the brand of it is, but you can just put white sugar. And, uh, and I say there is a substance in a, in a Ziploc bag in this bag. Uh, do you test the level of appropriateness of that as a food? And you can use a parallel scale to the Hawkins map of consciousness. So the inquiry would be on a scale parallel to the Hawkins map of consciousness, 1000 represents the most appropriate food for the body the level of appropriateness of the substance in the paper bag that is within a plastic bag within the paper bag, the level of appropriateness of that food as a substance on average over the previous 24 hours is 
And if it's white sugar then you haven't blessed it, Emma, then it's probably going to be below 200. Mm. So you can do things like that with people because people oftentimes are well-intentioned, but they're making claims that don't fit into the professional standards established by Dr. Hawkins and people have done lots of kinesiology. Yeah. Mm. Now, unless the per- unless they're mm. an, an other than human being, which you know I can't mm. speak to, their nervous system will likely not be able to handle that much energy. Mm. Yeah, go mm. ahead, Jeff. And testing in a team is the other key piece. Mm-hmm. So, you know, Clayton has taught me, we have several others on our team who also can test. And so when we're, when we're doing something like, for instance, testing the properties uh, every day, the new properties that have come on, because we, we, we maintain or guarantee a level of consciousness of the properties. If one person is different, you know, if if a person is getting a different result, then you stop. It's okay. You know, everybody drinks water, everybody thymus thumps or um, tries to recenter themselves. And then we we check each other to see if we're all clear and able to test accurately. Um, so to to me, when I'm testing and working on, say, a program for FLFE, you know, doing it with someone else is the key because you get tired, you get dehydrated and you go off the rails. And if you're not, if you don't have that other person also testing, then um, it's, it's really easy to, you know, like Clayton said, to embarrass yourself and get way off the rail and start testing 2000 for someone when that's just Mm. not, not accurate. So that's, so I think a group of people is really important. I love that. And I love it. It just, it reminds me of why I love you guys. Like over the years why I've followed your work is the, it's the level of integrity. You know, it's that, that level of making sure that, you know, cause the group just adds that layer of integrity as well. And I think um, that, you know, the consciousness of your business, I know we've, I've spoken about this before, but um, I'm really, you know, called to business at the moment that are very in integrity, that they're really here to serve and support the planet. And I think that so much of the work that you guys do in the FLFE, um, you know, you can feel it. You can feel that level of integrity within um, everything that you do and the testing and the retesting and the the excellence and the mastery that's going into it, um, which I think is so important because we do live in a world We've got so much knowledge out there. There's nothing we don't know. Um, we can access, you know, and whether that's you know, within the 3D reality, we can access things within the quantum. Um, but it's, you know, I love this distinction of, okay, well, um, yes, we can access these things. I've also had a big aha moment of why I have trouble muscle testing is because I will ask a question and then it's like there's this voice in my head that says, mm, that's not specific enough. And it's one of my things with my community. It's like specificity, like ask yourself a better question, ask yourself a specific question. So I think that I've almost answered my own question with um, kinesiology and muscle testing is that that specificity piece, because often I'll ask a big wide open question and clearly it's like, well, that could be a bazillion answers. It's, it's about refining it down. So <laughs> Feel like I've answered my own question. Um, do well, you well, want to second, respond to that? The second question you ask in kinesiology, the first, well, the first declarative statement you make or the first calibration is you check your polarity just to make sure. And then you you so the first one you hold a positive image in mind and you test, right? And mm-hmm. to see if you're, you know, if you're testing positive on a positive image, you're assuming your polarity is correct. The second one you the second step is you form the inquiry in your mind. Right, which is tricky because you have to know how to make an inquiry. It has to be a positive declarative statement. And then you test, I have permission to make this inquiry. Mm. Because we don't always have permission to make inquiries. And it's really easy to forget to do that. Because you know, I do I I I do about 20,000 calibrations a month now, which isn't that much, because just you know, checking your polarity is one calibration. I have permission to make this inquiry, it's another calibration. So if you're going to do, if you're going to test properties, we might do 150 calibrations in half an hour, just testing our properties every day. It's not easy to get, you know, 10 or 20,000 a month. Um, so that was, those are a couple of things that um, we just forget to do. Mm. Um, mm. You know, you have to, you have to 
ask you if you have permission to make the inquiry. Yeah. And then the last step that isn't in Hawkins' book, this is one of the things that he didn't say, but he left a clue in the beginning of truth versus falsehood. I won't tell you where, but when you get your data, then you have to ask permission if it's in the highest and best interest of all creation to share that data in the way you intend to share it with the people you intend to share it with because you're karmically responsible. Oh, so getting I the information that. is only part of the part of the answer. And I and I'm not saying I remember that one all the time. But I'm just saying that that's not in the that's not in the protocols that I've seen that Dr. Hawkins has created. And he does mention in the book. And that's why I, I believe he's so good at it that he's unconsciously competent. And he just, you know, he's so good at it. He, well, of course, you'd yeah. check that. But we are we, we know we're karmically responsible for what comes out of our, our of our mouth. And so why wouldn't you test that, especially for yeah. the big things, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. And yeah, I, I imagine that he, by the time he was actually sharing this information, there was so much just unconscious, just working mm -hmm. through him as opposed to this. It was brilliant. Ian, yeah. yeah. God, I wish he was still alive. Like Letting Go is also one of my all-time favorite books. It's oh, yeah. just it's so movie. good. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Now, I want to talk about uh, the FLFE because, uh, as I said, I walked the Camino in 2018. I put um, the FLFE on my home in 2019. And I do think that those things are very related. Like my life changed after the Camino and I definitely became super aware of having access to what I call higher quality problems, having access to higher quality solutions. Um and it was interesting because I sort of reviewed it when we were working towards the, the retreat that we did. It really occurred to me that everything stepped up. There was a really messy bit. Like there was that whole year of 2018 was a lot of shifting and changing. And then um, early 2019 for me, and I feel like I've heard this story for so many people, There was it was messy. It was like everything felt like it was recalibrating. Um, however, everything upgraded from there. And I even remember this story and I've told it before where I have two boys, they're four years apart. I mean, one of, my eldest is just about to turn 16. He's coming with me on the Camino, which is going to be super exciting. Um, but there was this moment not long after we put the FLFE on the house where I'm sitting at my desk and I can hear them in the other room and they, they bicker a lot. They still do. Um, I'm sure it's how they, you know, it's the connection that that they've created. I don't know, whatever. And um, I remember hearing them sit down on the couch and say, well, you made me feel like this. And the other one saying, well, you made me feel like this. And the other one says, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. And then they went outside to play together. And I was like, what just happened? I, I feel like I'm in an, <laughs> another dimension here. So that was one of the things other than the plants. That was another thing for me. The plants just sort of took off. But now that I've had this experience of having the FLFE on the house, having it on my phone, we had it as we went around Australia. Um, I would love you just to break down a little bit because money improved, health improved, relationship improved, my parenting improved, my business skyrocketed. Um, all of these things happened, you know, and mm -hmm. <clears throat> I wouldn't even say that I had like clear goals. It's just like everything started to click. Mm -hmm. So I suppose my question is, you know, share with me how the FLFE was helping me do mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Well, FLFE, first of all, it activates a high consciousness field for people that 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 don't know or haven't haven't heard about it. So we're activating a high consciousness field remotely. There's no device in the home. But this high consciousness field, it's it's like a pilgrimage spot, you know, it has these qualities of um, higher vibrating, high consciousness um, up in the unconditional love zone. Um, you know, it comes on at, at, at 550, which is right in unconditional love, and you can turn it up to 570 on the Hawkins map. So in that high consciousness field, and we've been now studying this with with Dr. Gary Schwartz, you know, we've had our own research going for the 10 years that we've that we've been doing FLFE, that it's been public. Um, is in that field, 
is unconditional love. So those part, there's many parts of us. There's many aspects of us. You know, there's relationships, there's financial management, there's career and life work. And Clayton did a lot of work to, to delineate all of those that parts of us might be low, like emotional age, low consciousness, where something happened to us, say around money, you know, our parents were fighting about money when we were young, or there was some, some kind of trauma around making money, having money, keeping money. And so that, that part of us is sort of broken off and it's, you know, it's, 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 it's just got its story. And that story is the low consciousness, fear based or whatever it is in low emotional age. And when we're soaking in that unconditional love zone, those parts of us can come up for forgiveness. You know, they come up to be loved. They come up to be um, integrated into the rest of us. And I think that's maybe the chaotic part that can happen, you know, where these, these, these old pieces are coming up, but in that unconditional love zone, we can just love and forgive ourselves and those people that were involved and, and that frees us from that voice. And so we're just, again, then we're, we don't have these little rubber bands pulling us back, these little negative voices saying, oh no, we can't do that. We'll get hurt. We'll run out of money. We'll, you know, we'll get divorced or, you know, there's these, when, when that happens, that's where, why we say freedom, we're free from those influences that could likely be unconscious and might become conscious occasionally. But so when that freedom, then we can just much more easily do what it is we want to do. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, finance, financial is one piece, but relationship, all of those lower consciousness, lower emotional age pieces of us rise up to be healed and to be loved on and then mm-hmm. and healed and integrated. Yeah, I love that. And it's definitely the experience that I've had, you know. Um, I actually had someone I work with, actually Heather, who also taught at the retreat. She works with the Akashic Records. And she said to me once, she's like, you have this ability that when a belief or something comes up, it's almost like you can just be like like the acknowledgement, you can just let it go. You know, like people have to work on it, but not necessarily you don't have to do that anymore. And I actually think it's being in this consciousness, having the FLFE on all the time. Um, the way it feels in my body is just trust. It's like I can trust myself or I can trust the universe or, mm-hmm. um, you know, I've had this experience recently where um, I grew up with my mother. Again, she was never diagnosed with, dis- with, um, with anorexia, but she displays all the behaviours of it. And um, so I had body image stuff. And just a few months ago, I just decided, I just decided no more. And I mean, I've done a lot of work on it over the years. So it's not like I've gone from hating on myself to to where I am now. But I just remember deciding one day, like, that's it, no more. I'm never going to pick on, you know, my tummy or I'm not going to pick on my thighs or that's it, I'm done. And every time I even think of going there, I'm just going to tell myself I love, like, I love my body and I especially love that bit And I reflect on it now and I'm like, that was really easy. Like rewiring my brain from depression and panic disorder, that took time and that wasn't easy. Whereas I feel like, you know, from a behavioral point of view, what it feels like is that I built the muscle because I've been in this place and it's almost like I've had Mm -hmm. that constant support from the consciousness around me that now I've built the muscle that when, when I want to shift and change something, it becomes so much easier because, you know, I have the belief in myself, in the universe. I, I just know I can do it. And I've got this, this level of consciousness that gives me access to the easier, more joyful, loving ways to go about it. Is that fair to say, or am I just making that stuff up? No, oh, no, it seems, yeah, very on the money. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, there's there, there's two principles here, um, at least two. One is the principle of the tipping point. And for many of us who've been doing our work a long time, uh, you know, it's, we get to, uh, you could call it a plateau. We get to a pretty good place. And it takes a long time for some of us to get to a good place. We weren't necessarily 
coming from a good place. So we earn, uh, we earn that elevation, if you if you want to call it. And uh, the average person uh, in the FLF environment that spends uh, 12 hours a day in the environment for 90 days goes up 30 points. So that's 30 mm -hmm. to the power of 10 times more energy than you had before. And that's a lot of more, a lot more positive energy. So the work that we've been doing, typically the, we, we experience a tipping point where we go to some other level and it feels so much more free, if you will. Uh, the second principle would be um, the, um, to those that have more is given. Mm. And, you know, the higher your level of consciousness, the, the great thing about it is the easier it is to become free mm. or freer. The higher your level of consciousness, the easier it is to raise your consciousness. And, you know, and for those of us who've been doing this work for decades, you know, and some people, you know, they came in really high and they may not struggle with it. Like, you know, I had an interesting uh, upbringing and uh, <laughs> I have had to work for my elevation, whatever, whatever elevation I have. Um, but it does get easier mm. to raise your level of consciousness as you get higher. And I don't know where this fits in, but recently we've talked about how many people who are really high that have fallen. So I don't just want to painted as a, a Pollyanna, there cannot be any bad things happen to you when you get really high. Every level has its challenges. Yeah. But overall, my experience and those that I've seen is that the higher we get, for the most part, the easier it is to grow. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. I love that. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I would add into that, that, you know, this idea that we have all these different aspects of ourselves, you know, these different domains, you could say, you know, like finance we we're talking about. And, um, you know, we can get really high in one of those uh, or maybe a group of those, but there could be other ones that are lower, like say relationships. So you're very, say you're very high in money management. You got big podcasts and people are, you know, coming to your seminars and you're, um, you know, you're really helping people in that domain, but there could be another area like relationship where it just falls apart. So I think what can happen to these, you know, elevated spiritual teachers or some people doing, you know, healing, um, John of God is, comes to mind. I mean, yeah. where they're very, very high in that area, but there's other areas that are low and eventually those trip, trip them up, you know, uh, whether the, there's an ego that, you know, sort of, flows into the other areas in relationship or sexuality is a big one for spiritual leaders where um, that trips them up or that becomes a, a low spot that, uh, that um, really causes problems in their life. Um, yeah. It's really interesting about depression. Um, we have, we've had a number of stories now and been talking to Dr. Schwartz about how do we go about testing this with our audience, with, with the FLFE community, but I have now four solid stories where the FLFE environment came on and depression, you know, changed dramatically. Mm. And mm. so there, I think there's also, also something about more energy in the environment. This could be another principle where when you're really low energy and you can't get out of bed, um, you don't even want to eat cook or eat and you know you're at that level that just having a higher vibrating environment it just people get more energy and they move through the levels and they start to get out of bed and mm. and do things um so that's the kind of stories we've been hearing and our our research at FLFE always kind of starts with the stories you know starts with the yeah. customers and what they experience or what we experienced the plants you know was one where people kept talking about their plants. So then we did a bunch of plant research. So yeah, I think it'd be interesting to go further with uh, depression and see, mm. see, yeah. see where it goes. I think it'd be fascinating. You know, obviously back when I was healing myself, I didn't have the FLFE and I, it was almost, I mean, it was, it wasn't a 
like an overnight thing, but it was a very short period of time. And I didn't have any mental health challenges growing up. Like I'd had anxiety demonstrated. Um, I did have a little bit of uh, like a social anxiety, but other than that, so it was a really big dramatic shift. And, you know, if I could go back and research, I think it was partly where I was, I just got married and I was taking on a lot of his stuff and I didn't realize I was taking on a lot of his stuff. Um, you know, it's crazy to think that that I would be so curious to know what were the other influences. Like, obviously, there was intergenerational stuff there, but what were the other influences that triggered it? Because even when I changed my environment, my physical environment, we moved from where we're living in regional Victoria to Sydney, even that, like, boom, like in that overnight, it felt so much so much better. So I would be super fascinated if I could go back in time and test all of those things because um, just reflecting and my journey, I'm like, wow, I put all that on me where now I, I look back and I think I was carrying stuff from everybody. My mum didn't cope very well with me getting married um, because, you know, she and I were so close and we all, um, we visited them all the time and then ended up living in this same place, which is where I actually ended up with depression. So they were living um, on the same property as us. So, yeah, I think this is what, what's fascinating because we spend so much time on the things that we can see. And even now we're starting to try and understand the brain and behavior and all those sort of things that that reach more into this can't see, but there's this whole other realm that is influencing us in such a big way. Um mm-hmm. And putting our finger on it is the challenge. And I, that's why I love the work that you guys do, because mm-hmm. I think there is part of me that wants to know exactly, like I want to have a tangible result and answer as something. Whereas working with the FLFE, it's helped me go, I don't need to know exactly how, or I don't need to have the exact clarity. I just know that there is something that's helping me get to where I want to go. Um, even mm-hmm. manifesting, I feel like for me now, manifesting is so easy. I decided a few months ago, that I was definitely going to get another horse. Like, yep, that's something that I'm going to do, um, but I won't do it till next year. And then literally out of nowhere, um, and I, I I wrote out a list and then forgot about it in my journal type of thing, and this dream horse is basically put in my lap. And I'm like, that. where did this come from? Like, how did, does this happen? So I really feel like that's so much of how the FLFE has really supported me and my business. And to go from a total shut-in introvert shy question myself all of those things to like hey everyone you want to talk to me in a uh, listen to me in a really short period of time I think that's also been very helpful to again it's all about trusting myself like stepping into my own power now the other area I really want to talk about which we haven't touched on yet is the ability or or the work that you do with the FLFE to mitigate EMF um Mm -hmm. This is something, again, we can't see it. I know it's happening. My eldest son had a massive um, response to EMF um, and it, that's in his design. Like from a human design point of view, some of us have this particular, I'm just going to say number in our environment that means that we're what we call an aura breather. So these mm-hmm. people, um, they're really affected by EMF and he's one of these people. And he would always, he had childhood asthma Um, you know, he was always, there was always mucus. There was always, you know, those sort of things. And then when we actually put the FLFE on the house, things started to really shift and change for him. And like, he doesn't have any of that now. And he was the one that I think I put it on his phone first. So it was with him all the time. Um, so we've had some massive breakthroughs with that. And my, my, it's on my phone and one of my dogs, I will often just, if I've sat down for a moment, she's on my lap. And if I've put my phone down, she will put her head on it. So part of me is like, <laughs> that's not normal. Like she loves it. So can we talk about, cause I know you've just, um, you've just started to do research and you've got some really good research coming in on this, the effort, the, um, the EMF. So do you want to talk a little bit to, to that? Sure. Um, I'll, I'll start on that. Um, yeah, I mean, as we, our mission is to support the evolution of consciousness. So EMFs came up as an issue in the evolution of consciousness. So 
that's kind of our perspective. Um, mm -hmm. And that's why we also clear the properties of negative history too, which would can really help, you know, like you were in these different situations. You, who knows what happened there? It could have been a massacre there. Could, you know, so that's early on, we saw we had to clear the properties of negative history. And then we started to see in doing our testing of properties that they weren't getting up to level. And we we have a guarantee. So we would call the person, your service is free until we figure this out. And what's happened? What's different? And it would be a you know, smart meter, new cell tower across the street, some big change in the EMF environment. So we knew we had to do something about that or we couldn't keep our promises anymore. And we couldn't create this pristine environment for people to evolve in. Um, so that, you know, that was kind of how we started on the EMF pathway, mm. um, which was really from a different perspective. I love and, that because uh, you were guided. You were guided there. I think that's so beautiful. Like, again, it, the, these intentions we put out into the ether are so important because then we get the guidance we need to do the work. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. You want to pick it up, Clayton? Yeah, so then we uh, we started studying how to mitigate EMF. And when we studied uh, that, we came across different perspectives on EMF. Some people tried to like just block them. Well, what does it mean when you block them? It usually means you're deflecting it somewhere else, right? And it's like, well, then you're amplifying it on someone else. So yeah. you didn't want to do that. And some people try to dissipate it in the environment and uh, sort of like make it less negative, if you will. It's like, okay, well, that's better than block than deflecting it or blocking it. And um, then we came across this principle called harmonization. And harmonization is like it's like an Aikido move. You take the energy, you take the energy of the attacker and you redirect the energy. Mm. So harmonization is taking the, you know, and look, we all benefit from technology. We couldn't, you're in Australia, we're in Canada and America. Thank yeah. goodness for technology. Right? Yeah, exactly. It's like, <laughs> thank goodness for Wi-Fi. I like my phone. It's handy. I mean, yeah. and I can turn it off if I want to, you know, but I wouldn't want to go back to not having a cell phone. Yeah. I think the world's probably a better place because of it. I don't know, but my opinion is I, I like it. So first of all, let's, you know, just have some gratitude for all the technology and all the people that have put all their time and every energy and in all the inventions and upgrades. So, um, so we came across this idea of harmonization and we thought, well, that's it. So we wanted to take the energy that came from negative EMFs because there's also positive EMFs. So a dog's, when a dog's wagging its tail, that energy coming off the dog is like 500. So that's Love a it. positive EMF. A cat's purring is 500. You know, if you're hugging your spouse, you're, you're both emanating positive EMF. So not all EMFs are, EMFs are bad. There's, you have beautiful plants, by the way. They're probably, well, they're emanating an EMF to some degree. Um, so we heard about harmonization. We thought, okay, wow, this is it. We want to learn harmonization. And we started doing research on all these substances. And we came across some research that sh said that shungite was the only substance in all of creation that could harmonize a negative EMF. Wow. Now, most people may not know this, but shungite is not um, natural to Earth. It, it's, it came from some asteroids that landed in Russia, and they mine it. So who knows where shungite came from or how it got here. But anyway, mm -hmm. it's here. And so it's like, well, how did, what, so what did we do? So I mean, a little bit of a long story, but we found a way to put the energetic signature of shungite into the FLFE environment in such a way that every negative electromagnetic field producing appliance in the environment, it made the emanations from that positive, including your router, your smart TV, your smart fridge, your smart stove, whatever, you know, baby monitors are really quite strong in negative, negative EMFs, portable phones uh, or wireless phones. And all of the negative electromagnetic 
frequencies that come onto the environment, into the environment, the way that the, the service can work is the, the energetic signature of Shungite goes out along those elect negative electromagnetic frequencies far enough that by the time it gets to the property, it's positive. So once we figured this out, and there may be some things missing that Jeff can fill in, I may be missing a few things. The level of conscious of the environment actually went up four points. Wow. Now we had to put a lot of energy in to get the four points. And it's not that we're trying to get it as high as possible because, um, you know, it takes a lot of time to adapt to a high consciousness field and, and manage it. And well, most of it's really, really easy. And the answer to becoming enlightened, if that's your goal, is not to have a super high consciousness field that's like 900 or 1,000. I mean, we get that it's in the highest and best interest of all for, for us to provide around 550, which is unconditional love. And, you know, we have boosts and things you can do. You have a 600 boost in the control panel. If you're a subscriber, you have an 850 boost for a few minutes. But the answer isn't for FLFE to turn up the energy higher. The answer for us is to do our work and get higher. Yes. I, I, don't, I don't know that raising, I think that adding more boosts will be helpful to people, but we're not convinced that having a much higher level because we could put a higher is really the answer. Mm, I love that. I just, I just want to respond to that because it's something that, you know, it's one of the things that's really driven me is in my diagnosis with depression and panic disorder, I was told like I had no power, that it was something that I would learn to manage, you know, with whatever protocols. And I remember in that moment being like, no, no, inside of me, I know I got myself here not on purpose, not consciously. I also know I can get myself out of here. So a large part of my work is putting the power back. You know, my mission is to shift the power from the few to the many. And I love that because, you know, this has been such a massive help for me, but it's not a crutch. And I think that's the thing that we have to be very careful of with um, all sorts of modalities these days, all sorts of tech these days is we still, we have to be taking our own power back. We have to be leading from the heart, um, you know, these things help us to be a better version of ourselves. But like you said, we have to be doing the work. And that's what I think is so beautiful. It, it's it's helping us, but it's not a crutch. Yeah, it's like providing that pristine, as pristine environment as we can get to. So we, we could be out in the outback, out in the woods somewhere, away from everything. Of course, now we've got satellites, but, you, you know, you could create a pristine environment, but for us to live our lives and be with our families and make a living. Um, we have, we're in these environments. So how do we make that as clean and pristine as possible? So then we can do our work and yeah. we're supported to love ourselves and forgive ourselves and forgive, love and forgive others. Um, but the, it was such a breakthrough moment to, to do this EMF harmonization. And the other thing we did is we raised the consciousness level of these emitters in the house and we found if if the level of conscious of the wi-fi router was 600 or depending on the 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 hertz of it it might be a little bit higher it became positive too so there's something there was so there's some kind of carrier wave that was negative that somehow gets cleaned up by by the the shungite and the higher consciousness field and you know we're in a frontier science here and Gary Schwartz has been great to, to help us to understand that. And in frontier science, the first thing you look for is, is something happening? You know, is there a real effect? And you mm -hmm. get scientific data that, that shows that, yes, there is a real effect and is statistically significant. Um, and that's what we did with, with EMF sensitivity. We, uh, we first, when we first discovered this, we were talking about it on webinars and some of our customers were like, oh my God, I need that, you know, let me be in your beta group. So we did a beta group and they, they you know, it was a very high level of relief from mm -hmm. the EMF. And these were people that were, couldn't sleep for, for weeks and weeks and uh, were anxious and brain fog. Those are some of the big ones. Um headaches, tension, feelings of like pressure across the head. And many of those people had had relief immediately when they when it, they put on 
the EMF mitigation with FLFE. So now all the service has it. Every every part of our service, uh, even the kid's phone, of course, has EMF mitigation on it. Mm-hmm. And so with Dr. Schwartz, what we did is we designed um, a survey and we found EMF sensitives uh, that had knew nothing about us. We're not maybe on the consciousness path. They, they just were suffering. Yeah. And we 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 did a survey. We started with 10. We recruited and we got 10 people. We got basically 100% of the people in the survey had had some degree of, of uh, relief. Wow. And, and about 30% had like almost 100% total relief. Wow. Um, and so we then we continued recruiting and we got 40 more, uh, recruits. So we have an N of 40, which gets very big and significant. And again, we're seeing a very large change, uh, 15 in 15 days, which is the free trial. There was a big drop in, in symptoms. And then at, at, at uh, 45, which would be, you know, after you've been on the service for a little while, it's an even bigger drop. Mm. So it's really exciting to have that actual data to f- back up the kinesiology and, yeah. and, uh, but we couldn't tell you exactly how it works. You know, we know mm. that this is working uh, and that's really a frontier science yeah. situation. And, and um, you just apply science to what's actually happening. Yeah. I love it. I am at, through the frame of human design. One of my, you know, most, significant themes is that I am all about experimentation and experience. So mm-hmm. I know for me that that's been the biggest piece that when I look back and reflect, um, you know, I've healed my physical body out in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, even to the point where sometimes, you know, I will lift, I will look at my phone, like I'm setting an intention with it, you know, with the FLFE and I'll be like, my intention is, or can you help me with, or can you support me with, like, I should just be asking my guides, I suppose I am at the same time, but you know, I've even worked with it like that, being very conscious of saying FLFE, can you please help me with X? Um, And I've, I've found really significant shifts and yeah, my whole life has changed. And even my, it's it's my being, you know, it's, it's one of the things that I'm so aware of because I've lived so many years, not loving being in this meat suit that I love being in here, whether it's in the meat suit, whether it's in my consciousness. Um, And I think that's a lot of what I attribute to having the support of the FLFE so that I can you know, go in further, go deeper, you know, be more me and really be able to trust that process. And then, you know, mm. the serendipities just seem to follow <laughs> as, as I go. So I love that. I'm so conscious of your time. There's so much I would love to still ask you, but I want to make sure that um, everyone gets what they need from today. So Obviously, we're going to put in the show notes, we're going to put the links to join up the free chart trial for the FLFE. Now, again, I'm always going on about the integrity of these two humans and their the work. Um, you can sign up for the free trial, whether it's on your phone. You can do the phone and then you can do the house and you get the free trial and you don't have to put your credit card details in, all of those things. So I feel like that's so in itself is just a demonstration of the values of the business and you can give it a shot. So we're going to put the links in the show notes. Um, but is there anything else that you would love to share with our listeners before we finish up? Hmm. Well, for having closing thoughts, just thank you for having us on Emma and introducing us to your community. We appreciate uh your fangirlness. It's kind of cute. Thank you. I'll take it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Jeff was at a conference a little while ago and it's, uh, and there's a lot of people there that, that came and shared how we've been able to help them change their life. And mm. yeah, it's very, very rewarding to be part of something like this. And uh, yeah, we had a really crunchy conversation today with somebody and after that, I was just really grateful to be in business with Jeff because, you know, we, we have maybe disagreements from time to time, but we always come back to peace and it's not peace at any price. It's peace through owning 
what is yours and uh, giving the other person a bit of slack to be human you know mm. give yourself some slack so if if i have any closing thoughts it's you know you don't want to be a total slacker but maybe a little bit of slack <laughs> i love it i love it <laughs> jeffrey yeah it just feels like freedom you know to for us humans we're so powerful we're so amazing beings and um and we've been you know in situations that have held us back in some ways perhaps and we've held ourselves back and uh it's just uh i think it's an exciting time to be alive that people are waking up to their true power and um to the support that's out there for them to be who they are and really mm -hmm. own it and uh, really shine. And mm -hmm. so I'm just grateful to be alive at this time. I love that. Thank you both so much. Um, and I, I absolutely believe in the power of the human race. You know, I've always had this thing inside of me that I fundamentally believe in humans. And especially early on in my relationship with my husband, he's like, no, no. Well, how can you have this faith in the human race? I'm like, Trust me, just trust me. I don't know why, but they, 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 they're they're going to work it out. We're all going to work it out. And I love this this piece of really helping people get back into their power in whatever way that is. You know, taking back the reins of their own life because that's how we're going to navigate to this new world, this new paradigm. And the work that you guys are putting out in the world is going to help us all navigate that with more ease and more grace. And um, yeah, I'm pretty confident I will continue to fangirl for a long time. So thanks so much, guys, for being here. Thank you for having us. We'll have to uh, do it again another time and not too far mm -hmm. after the Camino. And then I can, after now I've got, Camino. now I feel like I've got an extra mission for the Camino, which is very exciting. Um, and send, yeah, and send us some, some photos so we can, definitely. you know, give you some feedback. Definitely. I will absolutely do that. So thank you guys. Thanks everyone for listening. Um, I trust you got what you needed from today's episode and I look forward to having you on the next one. Bye for now. Thanks everyone for being here all the way to the end of the podcast. I hope you got lots of value out of it. I certainly had a lot of fun doing it. Could I please ask that you share this podcast with friends if you found it valuable? And also, bonus points, could you leave a review for me as well on Apple? It would be greatly appreciated. If at any point you would like to be on the podcast or you've got questions that you'd like me to discuss on the podcast, by all means, get on my socials and DM me. Everything you need is there in the show notes. Have an awesome day. Bye for now.